In our very first story, more than a 130-member team of police and military personnel have been deployed to the northern region town of Bimbela as scores of residents seek refuge in the police station there following a gun battle that erupted Thursday. Interior Minister Ambrose Derry, who disclosed this at a news conference Friday, said government would not interfere in the chieftaincy dispute, which sparked the violence. We'll hear from him shortly, but the latest figures from the death toll has reached 10. Let's first hear the ordeal of Alima, who is a resident in Bimbila. She lost seven of her relatives, most of whom were women. They killed seven people in our house, six women and one man. The attackers who came for their husbands killed them because they did not meet their husbands at home. They killed four women, two children, and one man. I wasn't home when it happened. I heard the bad news from the village I traveled to to do business, so I came back home this morning. When I was told about the tragedy, I was confused because I least expected it. They say some people are against the enskinment of a chief, so they came to the house and shot them. We have not wronged them in any way. My husband's father is the one who is taking over as chief when the chief of Bimbila dies. So they are jealous and claim he is supporting this new chief about to be enskinned. They were firing gunshots and people were running away, but the woman did not escape because it is believed that women are not usually killed in such clashes. So they were home. I was lucky I left for the market yesterday. Otherwise, I would have been killed too. The men did not leave home on purpose. Some of them were at work and others were at their rice farms in some villages when it happened. We have all deserted the house and there is no one there. Nobody expected them because the country started from the palace area. Our house is located in the outskirts of the village. All our children are home now and they do not go to school. So that's the ordeal of uh, Alima, who is a resident of Bimbila, whose relatives, seven of them, were killed yesterday. Now, as we indicated earlier, the police CID has dispatched personnel from the elite unit of the service to Bimbila uh, to help maintain law and order in the area. The reinforcement team is made up of personnel from the action units of the service and crime scene management unit at the CID headquarters here in Accra. Well, Interior Minister Ambrose Derry has been addressing a news conference on the matter today. He's been speaking about a wide range of issues. First of all, let's hear him speak about the death toll and the casualties. As you are all aware, the past four years, there has been a curfew imposed on Bimbila. It was initially from 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. But last year, convinced that the situation had improved, the curfew was varied 8 p.m. to 6 a.m. The present situation has compelled us, as from yesterday, to impose a curfew from 4 p.m. till 6 p.m., 6 a.m., 4 p.m. to 6 a.m. As of yesterday, two, we had two persons dead. As I speak to you, the number has increased to 10. Regrettably, of these 10, six are women, three are children all of four years, one girl and two boys, and only one adult male. 
At present, we have 18 persons injured. And I'm told the condition of some of them remains to be assessed. Mr. Ambrose Derry has also been given details about the uh, number of police personnel and military personnel uh, who have been deployed to the area. Listen. We've deployed 130 police officers and 40 military personnel in the area. 130 police and, one, and 40 military, making a total of 170 security personnel on the ground now. As I speak to you, a crack team of 13 detectives and operational men from the police are moving in to support the situation. Now, uh, you do know that it was as a result of uh, the attempt by a faction in this uh, conflict which uh, attempted to install uh, a chief in the area that sparked the violence. Well, the interior minister says government will not interfere in the chieftain's dispute. Our information is that it is a chieftain's matter. I want to make it clear that the position of the government is that we are not going to interfere in any chieftains and matter that remains the remit of traditional authorities and where anybody feels he or she has a cause of action to resort to due process, in this case, the regional house of chiefs, to the National House of Chiefs and Supreme Court where applicable. But we want to make it clear that we intend to protect the lives and property of each and every citizen or resident in Ghana in consonance with the commitment made by His Excellency the President. So these lives that have been lost are regrettable. One life is one life too many to be lost. And we want to assure that we will take all steps necessary to protect all persons who are resident in Bimbila. Meanwhile, the National Peace Council's Northern Regional Executive Secretary, Reverend Father Thaddeus Kusa, has called on the Supreme Court to quickly rule on the Bimbala case uh, to end the atrocity that keeps recurring in the town. Speaking earlier on the pulse with Giftia Piando, Reverend Father Kusa pointed out that it's about time both parties understand each other to retain peace in the town. The issue in Bimbala is purely an intra gate uh, chieftaincy problem and over the period we have been able to bring them together a number of times and they are all willing to get the issue over over them mm. but the issue as it stands now um, is illegal has a legal connotation because it's at the supreme court and each of the parties to the or the factions to the conflict are eagerly awaiting the supreme court ruling because they all have their own interpretation to the, to, the, to the rulings of the National House of Chiefs, which gave the mandate to the current region as the, the one who should be officially recognized. Mm. So, um, and the appeal has been made by the other side the, or the family, and they think that with that appeal, the region has no uh, jurisdiction in certain uh, traditional issues like Enskimment of cheese, uh, which actually, I must say, brought about the current situation mm. we are all facing. Mm. So it's a legal issue for now, and okay. I think the legal uh, people should try to help us mm. to come out with uh, their own verdict so that at least we'll move on from there.
Okay. Will that be the antidote? Because um, I've been engaging one of my colleagues here who's been following this problem and has also studied in that area, in the security uh, area, I must say. And one of the things that he's saying is that once the, uh, the Supreme Court is able to uh, put out their ruling on this matter, that perhaps should suffice. In, from where you stand, uh, do you agree with that position? I, 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 I agree 100% uh, with that statement because uh, all the engagement we have been having with them, the dialogue process we have been having, it has come up clearly that they are all waiting for the Supreme Court to come up. It's very, mm. you know, they, even the last time we met them, that was about two weeks ago, they came out with common activities they wanted to go and uh, and undertake in the community. You know, despite the fact that the case in the Supreme Court, they still recognize each other as brothers and sisters, mm. working together. You know, and we could see um, an improvement in a relationship uh, in understanding issues about the chieftaincy, mm. but this is the bottom leg. And until we get through this issue, we will continue to have this problem emerging because the region who is sitting at the moment on the ruling of uh, the National House of Chiefs believes that he has a mandate to execute mm. and perform traditional uh, functions, right. including a scheme of uh, chiefs. Okay. But the other side thinks that no, once the appeal has been made at the Supreme Court, that mandate does not exist. So the legal interpretation of the issue is what will bring, I will say, a solution to this problem in Bimbra. Legal interpretation. You mentioned that they've been working together as brothers, uh, or let's say brothers and sisters. And this was how long ago? Oh, we, the last time we met them was just about two weeks ago in Samale. And everything sounded, looked okay? Yes, they were okay. They were okay. Also, yesterday, I, I took it by surprise to hear that um, this has gone on. Because, but later on, I realized that it was out of the process of skinning a warrior or the chief of the warriors. Mm. So if, that, that, yes. if the two of them have been working together, and there appeared to be some kind of understanding between them as they wait for the verdict of the Supreme Court. What, from where you sit, will be that trigger that makes one, one faction what, not want to even listen to security advice that do not go ahead with this enskinment? What will be that thing that triggers such, um, if you want, uh, uh, for lack of a better word, uh, 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 impunity? You see, the whole thing is about uh, legitimacy. Um, the, the, the current region thinks that his, uh, what do you call it, uh, his reign as a legitimate regent of Bimbla has been undermined. Right. And he would definitely would like to exercise that legitimacy because he thinks that he has been given the mandate by the National House of Chiefs. Right. And the other uh, side of the family, or the divide, would also will not recognize because of their interpretation mm. of the process, the legal process at the moment. You know, so that's why I'm saying that if the Supreme Court is able to de come out with a determination, uh, they are all saying that they will be ready to accept the outcome of the Supreme Court ruling, because that's the highest court of the land. Mm. But at the moment, the legal understanding of the issue is not clear, because each of the family has its own uh, interpretation of the process. You're watching Joy News Prime. Earlier you heard uh, Reverend Father Thaddeus Kusa. He's the Northern Regional Executive Secretary of the National Peace Council, speaking earlier on The Pulse with my colleague Gifta, Gifty uh, Ando Apia. We're taking a short break. Don't go away. There's more news ahead. You're welcome back. Now, residents of Mafi Dove in the central Tong district of the Volta region are complaining about the fast deteriorating state of a newly constructed access road there. According to them, the contractor did a shoddy job. It has resulted in the road developing defects shortly after completion. They want the Ekufuado-led government to, as a matter of urgency, send the contractor back to site to repair the damaged portions of the road. <laughs> The 19-kilometer Dover Junction Dover Abayuma feeder road project was awarded to First Sky Limited in 2015 
Construction of the road funded by a World Bank loan facility with support from the government was completed a year ago and handed over to the feeder roads department. However, the road has started developing potholes with bitumen eroding off some sections whilst its drains have become breeding grounds for mosquitoes. Hosa Gago, a resident of Mafe Dove, mentioned that several attempts to draw the contractor's attention to some shortfalls observed during construction were ignored. <coughs> Just at your back here, you can see that uh, this place is a waterlocked area. So during the time they are doing uh, this drainage here, they diverted the drainage to the uh, area they do uh, the, 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 there's a uh, residence living at that uh, 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 place. So I they directed uh, this in the drainage to there. Some of us were advising that already the place is a waterlocked area. So if they directed the drainage to the place, it will develop the people more of the uh, 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 water may be flooding. But the contractor didn't listen to us. The question they asked us is that, do we need road or we are, are we preventing the people that uh, uh, water shouldn't disturb them? And we say, ah, we need the road. But here in the case that uh, it's not that uh, because of the road that uh, our people should die in the water. But he didn't mind us. There is a similar development on the Pando Alavano stretch of the road linking Pando and Hohoi municipalities, which is also being constructed by First Sky Limited. Residents there also have similar concerns. Checks at the Volta Regional Secretariat of Feeder Roads indicate that the Dover Junction of the Yuma Road is in liability effects period. According to the Feeder Roads Regional Engineer, David Asensu, Works on the Pando Alavano stretch is about 65% completed, but works have stalled because the contractor is waiting on government for payment to resume work. Dover, that is Dover Junction, Dover Junction, Dover to Abeyme, Fila Road is uh, 19 kilometers. And the, it was awarded to Meche First Car Limited. As we speak now, the project uh, has been completed mm -hmm. and is still in the defects liability period. Mm -hmm. That is, if you say defects liability period, after the project is completed, we have a period within which we monitor any defects that would uh, come up so that it is remedied. Fred Kwame Asari's reports for Joy News. Now, thanks to a new initiative by the government of Ghana, visually impaired students should find it a lot less challenging gaining admission into colleges of education. Of the 40 spread around the country, very few are able to admit such students due to the lack of facilities to uh, cater to their peculiar needs. The challenge fund awarded by the government should, however, enable colleges such as the Nasrat Jahan Ahmadiyya College of Education to increase the intake of visually impaired teacher trainees by 50% in 15 months. Rafiq Salam was at the launch of the challenge fund at the college in Wa. Transforming teacher education and learning detail is a four-year government of Ghana program aim at supporting the implementation of a new policy framework for pre-tertiary teacher professional development and management. As part of this change agenda, TTEL rolled out a challenge fund grant award for colleges of education to come up with innovative ideas that will help improve the quality of teaching and learning at the various colleges of education in the country. Worried about the low intake of visual impaired teachers for these at colleges of education in the country, authorities at Nasrat Jahan Ahmadiyya College of Education took it upon themselves to write a proposal to that effect in order to attract and up the enrollment figures of visual impaired persons to the colleges. Ismail Asmao is the principal of the college. Over the years, our intake of students with visual impairment has not been the best. Out of the current student population of 1,131, only 12 are visually impaired. This is not a good trend, and it is my avid desire 
to change the current drift by multiplying, if not quadrupling, the intake of students with visual impairments in my college to give them the needed professional skill training in the noble field of teaching. The project is also to build the capacity of our tutors in braille and management techniques of students with visual impairment. National President of the Ghana Blind Union, Aisa Jinsung, was full of praise for Nostradjan Amadea College of Education for the initiative. The sighted ones can look for places for themselves, but the blind students will have to wait until the following year. And if they wait, other blind students will come and add, and every year, few students will be taken. But thank God this project has come. And I thank the management of um, NJ Ahmadiyya College for taking this project. They have solved Aisha's problem and have solved all visually impaired persons in the northern sector's problem. Vice Principal of the College, Sally Said, in an interview with Joy News, threw more light on the Challenge Fund project. You know, we have in this country a lot of people tag uh, visually challenged and people with disability with a, a, a lot of uh, uh, social uh, uh, with social challenges. People think uh, disability probably is 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 a, is a bad woman. Now we want to challenge that, and if we're able to 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 increase the intake. We will be training students with visual impairment to come out with something valuable on hand, which will be the teaching certificate, a diploma certificate, and they will no longer, it means we are taking a number of visual impaired students out of the streets and will give them meaningful job. Reporting for Joy News, Rafik Salam. Wa. Now, Parliament has approved by consensus the ministerial nomination of Tourism Minister uh, Catherine Afeku and 10 others. The minority had earlier indicated its plans to oppose the nomination over her inability to undertake national service, but it backed down. Those approved include Sports Minister Isaac Isiama and Minister for Parliamentary Affairs Oseche Mensa Bonsu. Minority Leader Haruna Idrisu urged Ms. Isiama to be moderate uh, in his temperament as he officially assumes office. I rise to second the motion for the adoption of the fifth report of the Appointments Committee on His Excellency the President nomination for ministerial appointment. And Mr. Speaker, with your permission to make a few remarks about a number of them, in particular, and in supporting the motion, in particular to begin with the House Leader, the Honorable Osei Chie Mensa Bonsu, Minister Designate for Parliamentary Affairs. Mr. Speaker, as the nominees appeared before the Appointments Committee, the exchanges were very cordial, and particularly for the leader whose tenure in this House eclipses many, if not all. I'm sure with the exception of the Honorable Alban Sumani Bagbin, the Honorable Chairman sir, will belong to a class of his own as a senior senator or as a senior member of parliament, having served his constituent and the people of Ghana and parliament well. We trust that, Mr. Speaker, he will support you to build a more responsive, transparent, and formidable parliament that will hold the executive accountable for his actions. Mr. Speaker, we take encouragement in his commitment to support you for this House to have an improved standing orders, which, Mr. Speaker, your person have already given a public indication to support. Mr. Speaker, is also forthright in sharing and having harmony with you in your thought of the sponsorship and promotion of a private member's bill. Mr. Speaker, undoubtedly, the Honorable Oseiche Mensah Bonsu comes to the leadership with immense experience as minority and majority leader. Mr. Speaker, he stated all the soup, the one without uh, onion and, and pepper and salt, and the one with salt. 
and therefore he would appreciate that what he must do. And Mr. Speaker, he must start well. As this House is meeting at this material moment, I believe the staff are unhappy, members and staff. Well, uh, MP for Wild West, Joseph Yelechire, however, raised concerns about the absence of a legal instrument supporting the ministries. I want to point out one important thing, in particular about the creation of the ministries. Act 600 requires the president to create ministries, departments, and realign them. We are approving these ministers, but there is no executive instrument from the president to show us where they are going. Secondly, we will soon be filing questions. So if you don't know which minister you should address, which departments are under a ministry, it will be difficult for us to file our questions for ministers to answer. I urge the majority leader to work hard. Now he's also a minister. And my problem is that will he be reshuffled outside the majority leadership? <laughs> now, there will be confusion. The other issue will be that if the president doesn't act timely to delineate the roles and departments properly for these ministers, we will spend six months fighting for test. Each minister wanted to take one part or the other. So I think that he should work very fast to clearly define and let this parliament be aware of who is to do what. And when they fail, we can hold them responsible. Now, we have praised all of them. The women on this group, the women in the group have done very well. But Cecilia Dapa promised that she was going to work on the, finish the work that has been started on the war airstrip. So that weekends to, I can go to the airport, take care. And we do understand that uh, shortly, uh, President Ekufuado will be swearing in the newly approved nominees. will be crossing over live to the Flagstaff House for that ceremony. But joining me in the studio now is parliamentary correspondent uh, Joseph Opoku-Gapu, who brought us all those details. Joseph, let's talk about um, Katharina Feku, the tourism minister's uh, nomination. We know that she also did not undertake the mandatory national service. Uh, did that come up at all during the debate on the floor on the committee's uh, report? Actually, it didn't. It's interesting how things eventually turned out. And so um, when the report was laid on the floor of the House, the chairman of the committee, Jose Usu, read it. Um, and then a number of members of parliament, both on the side of the majority and also on the side of the minority, commented on the recommendations of the report and what they expect the nominees who, have been who were to be approved to do going forward. None of them, no one on the majority side, no one on the minority side, even mentioned the issue of um, her national service, and no one offered any explanation, particularly from the minority side. It's quite surprising, though, it, because it that's is, one is. of the reasons the minori minority cited it for is. kicking against Otiko Jabba's uh, nomination. And the interesting bit is that um, even after the session, uh, we tried um, having interviews with some of the members of parliament, particularly on the minority side, seeking explanation on how come things look quite different when it comes to um, Katrina Feku, but um, all of them declined comment. The indication being that it goes back to one of the issues that came up earlier that looks like the main concern that the minority had with Otiko did not exactly have to do with the issue of her national service. It was about her demeanor and the alleged insults that she had thrown at the president, which they really wanted her to withdraw, which was how come they needed something of substantial uh, basis, the, the legal thing having to do with the national service, mm -hmm. and then they use that to drag her nomination okay. back. So very quickly, does this conclude mm -hmm. the vetting process of all the ministerial nominees? So, uh, you know, Parliament has approved 36 of them. These are the substantive ministers. What is left now is the 10 regional ministers. Vetting of those would begin on Tuesday or would run until Thursday. And then we look forward to the deputy ministerial batch as well. Very well. Thank you very much. Uh, and that's uh, parliamentary correspondent Joseph Opoku Gapo. You're watching Join News Prime. I am Marvel Crimson. Don't go away. Business is up next. You're welcome back. Now, the Administrator General has called for the prosecution 
of any member of the previous administration found to have been responsible for the alleged missing of over 200 state vehicles at the presidency. David Yarrow says the current administration must query the past chief of staff or his chief director who submitted to him a signed copy of a vehicle inventory that had a total of 678 cars. He spoke on the Super Morning Show with Kojo Yangson. In my record, 678. 678, thank you. Yes. Uh, now, uh, did this include an actual physical check of each vehicle? No, you mean the answer general to go and count them one by one? Yes. No, 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 it didn't because uh, we uh, have made sure that all these are captured in the handover notes. And the handover notes were discussed with the incoming and outgoing ministers of state, and they agreed. So as soon as you do that, they become the property of the state or agency in charge. So it's now the responsibility of the agency to look at the handover notes vis-a-vis -vis what is on the ground. They are now to do the fiscal check to be sure that uh, what is being handed over to them is there before they sign and take up. Okay, so um, just just to be clear, the Administrator General's office did not physically see these 678 vehicles. You simply no, saw... No, no. Our, yes, our duty is just to build a database of these properties. And you can appreciate it that uh, even looking at the challenges, the office is a present alone. For me to go and see, assemble all 300 of these for me to count. Then I'll go to Minister of Defense. Minister of Foreign Affairs, Minister of this, Regional Coordinating Council, Takura, the regional, no, it's going to be just next to impossible. It is now the minister's responsibility to make sure that his property is secured. So if you look through and your property is not there, you will follow up. If you say, take your phone number, and finally, a, a car number V8, what and what is not there, you just look around uh, to the of, uh, officers supposed to be using it. Then you identify that this car is in the hands of this person. And then you, you take steps to, to, to retrieve your vehicle. Okay, so uh, just to be clear, for the benefit of our listeners, the Administrator General's office and uh, yourself, you have no way of confirming that the list of vehicles that was tendered during the handing over process is accurate. Yeah, of course, we are dealing with a human institution. Uh, uh, one or two miscreants could decide you know, for purposes known to them, not to uh, include some of them in the handover notes. In that case, it would be difficult for me. But if that happened and later is det detected that a car is missing, then the minister should be held responsible. On the other hand, if the handover note didn't include any vehicle, but it, finally it was it is detected that this, this vehicle belongs to this minister, but it wasn't included, uh, then the officers who compiled the decision should also be held responsible for that. Now, the new ambassador, the Brazilian ambassador to Ghana, Lodema Aguia Neto, has been sharing the Brazilian slum experience and how they've managed to raise living standards of slum dwellers in Rio de Janeiro. He says bringing education and healthcare, as well as small scale businesses closer to slums, is a proven model for reducing violence and developing slums. He spoke to my colleague, Gifty Andoapia, when he paid a courtesy call on the multimedia leadership. We implemented some national policies, okay. social inclusion policies uh, from, the, from, the, from the national government. For instance, uh, low income housing, mm -hmm. new housing, new units that were built to take people away from risk areas mm. in the slums. We had those social inclusion initiatives, mm. like for instance housing, but we had also some health initiatives. Okay. For instance, the city of Rio de Janeiro, the municipality of Rio de Janeiro, decided to establish uh, uh, health, uh, primary uh, health clinics all over the city. And, and we, we managed to jump from 3.5 to 70% okay. the number of people that would have access to primary health, health yeah. attention healthcare so that they don't need to go to hospitals mm. would flood the hospitals okay. the emergencies okay. see and we have social workers from the community itself who would go door to door every month 
and update the, uh, the, the information, the, the, the uh, medical background of those families. Mm. Yes. So that would help. Uh, education, of course, we uh, increased the number of schools in, in, uh, in Rio de Janeiro, and we tried to uh, bring back what we had in the 90s, oh. where all uh, students in public schools had uh, uh, what we call a full, uh, full time. Uh, full-time uh, full -time. Uh, education, uh, okay. how do you call it? So they don't go to school, they don't run a shift system. Exactly. Yes. And uh, you would have mm -hmm. the academic education, but also we would add two more hours of sports and arts. Ah. You see, so we aim to get to 35% already, and the idea ah. is to have 100% uh, of mm -hmm. uh, uh, students mm -hmm. in public schools attending the whole day, attending yeah. school the whole yeah. day. Creation of local jobs, okay. the small, businesses, small businesses, you see. Uh, what we saw with the, with the uh, decrease of violence uh, because mm. of the policies that the state government and the municipal government uh, implemented in yeah. uh, Rio de Janeiro, I'm talking about Rio de Janeiro mm. because I know more about, uh, about the, about the case because place. I was That's there in okay. the last four years. Now, if you bear the name Nelson, Azuma, or D'Souza, chances are you have Brazilian ancestry. Over 180 years ago, some of the freed slaves from Brazil settled along Ghana's coast, Jamestown to be precise. They're called the Tabon people. The Brazil Embassy, in collaboration with a professor at the University of Ghana, will soon roll out a DNA program intended uh, to trace remnants of the Tabon lineage. The DNA program will also help the embassy to gather statistics about them. There's a documentary coming, uh, coming on, and we wanted to be part of the 60th uh, uh, anniversary celebration of, of Ghana. And then we have this DNA project, which is to uh, try to identify uh, who are the Tabom, what, uh, what's the DNA origin, how many Tabom also went to other parts of Ghana, and try to uh, know their know uh, who they are trace who they them are, basically. trace them exactly okay. uh, the idea is to uh, well, well having the dna of those uh, people you would try to identify in other areas of the country who have who those people who have similar dnas and then you would then identify that those people in other areas are also uh, from tabon okay. origin Now, Accra's Only Girls Correctional Center has in the last few years been compelled to relegate reinformation of the girls, reformation of the girls brought to the facility because it has had to deal with more fundamental concerns. It says without food and basic amenities for their upkeep, it's unable to focus on its core mandate. Join you, says Zarina Mandi has been to the South Laboni Junior Girls Correctional Center and reports. Like many other government-run facilities, the failure to provide basic funding to barely sustain them is crippling their operations. <laughs> this is the only junior girls' correctional center in the capital, Accra. The center also houses the boys' remand home, shelter for abused children, and the South Laboni Girls' Vocational Training Center. Located in an obscure part of Accra, the facility faces various challenges, including the need for basic items such as food. Commissioned in 1986, the vocational center trains girls in various vocations, while the boys' remand home takes into custody juvenile offenders between the ages of 12 to 17. The shelter for abused children, which is also housed there, is a referral center for children who have been abused for protection. But for caretakers, the condition of the school makes it difficult to run it smoothly. Love Grace Alija manages the center. People who know here, one or two people come here to donate. So those who know, they come. And the majority of them help us. It's a government institution. Government provides some funds. But we need more people to donate so that we'll be able to cater for these children. The inmates should ideally be taken through vocational training such as bead making, dressmaking, catering, and hairdressing to help them gain skills and reintegrate them easily into society. But without the needed funding, the correctional center has come to rely heavily on the benevolence of members of the public, such as Patricia and Trisha Dake, who celebrated their 18th birthday with the inmates of the various homes. This is so much better than a party, like me and my friends, and we're going clapping. This is way better than that, so I'm happy. 
we wanted to encourage other people and create awareness to like to other people that there are other homes that are in need they can give more than just a bag of rice or something they can give like cement to create like a whole different environment for them to live in the twin sisters decided to use their savings and contributions from friends to make the sari possible. They also donated some items to the center. Zarina Mandi for Joy News. Now, construction of a five-story classroom block at the KNUST Senior High School in Kumasi has stalled even as the authorities struggle to manage the congestion brought on by inadequate classrooms. Officials say the contractor responsible for the project, which began seven years ago, cannot be traced, in Shrefem's Nana Asensu Mensa reports. Assistant Headmaster Daniel Buamadiku says the delayed project, which started seven years ago, exposes students to congestion. He is asking for swift government intervention to address the challenges. Mr. Buamadiku believes additional 10 computers to the old ones will worsen the congestion situation. And then to my year group for their presentation of the 10 computers. Uh, this is going to help out. Chairman of the donor group, Reverend Aziko Pukwaji, may throw more light on the guest. Well, this is 91-year group of TechSec, and today we came to our old school to come and present computers to the school. We heard that they were having some challenges in their laboratory, and we thought it wisely that as 90 year, 91 year group, we organized ourselves for those who are in America, Europe, and also in Ghana, and we contributed, and then we purchased 10 computers from Canada to come and present to our school to enhance the growth and also for the development of the school. That's a reporting for Joy News. Now to a worrying situation. Ghana's maize production faces a threat from army worms known to have already caused widespread uh, destruction in other parts of Africa. It follows the discovery of the pest in parts of the Ashanti region where some farmers are losing acres of cultivated fields. Mahmoud Mohamed Nurdin reports. The deadly pests fall army worms have wreaked havoc in Malawi, Mozambique, Namibia, Zambia and Zimbabwe and work is underway in Ghana to establish how two species entered the country for the first time, their mode of spread, and how farmers can control them in an environmentally friendly way. Adam Isa is a farmer at a ferry in the Achumawabija district of the Ashanti region. Though he practices irrigation farming, his maize farm has been devastated in the last three months. At least 2,500 Ghana cities has already been spent on spraying the farm without positive results yet. On a daily basis, his son, 24-year-old Mason Adam, comes to the farm to help his father fight the destructive pest. Oh, the powder that we use on maize, okay. and we used it and they started. So we thought that powder was expired, and that was causing the problem. But it happens to be that was not it. The fall armyworm threatens food security and experts in agriculture one quick intervention. Dr. Robert Edu, an agriculture economist and lecturer at the Kwame Krumah University of Science and Technology, points out Ghana's agriculture productivity has been falling for years. Yeah, the beans and birds can really reduce your, 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 your yield. Um, like I said, you can have total coffee and you can grow the crops and then pests like grasshoppers and locusts can come and finish your whole food for you. Some of them will feed on the leaves and when they feed on the leaves, then the leaves cannot use the sun's energy to convert it into food and store for humans to also go and harvest and, and consume. And some also work on the farm, they feed on it and so these and are critical and when they affect crops and we don't treat them and try to eradicate them, then we are already going to experience reduction. And that report was filed by Mohammed Nuruddin. Up next is Entertainment News. Don't go away.
Okay. All right, you're still watching Joy News Prime. Let's go live. Uh, let's cross over now to the Flagstaff House, where President Akufuado is swearing in 11 ministerial nominees, including Minister-designate for Tourism, Arts and Culture, Catherine Apeku. I'll come to my knowledge. All shall come to my knowledge. In the discharge of my official duties. In the discharge of my official duties. Except as may be required. Except as may be required. For the discharge of my official duties. For the discharge of my official duties. Or as may be specially permitted by law. Or as may be specially permitted by law. So help me God. So help me God. Honorable Mavis Howard Kumsen, Minister for Special Development Initiatives. Honorable Awal Mohammed Ibrahim, Minister for Business Development. Honorable Mustafa Abdul Hamid, Minister for Information. Honorable Isaac Asiyama, Minister for Youth and Sports. <laughs> Honorable Samuel Kufi Ahiave Jamesi, Minister for Chieftaincy and Religious Affairs. Honorable Cecilia Abna Dapa. Minister for Aviation. <laughs> Honorable Boniface Abu Bakar Sadiq, Minister for Inner City and Zongo Development. Honorable Elizabeth Na Afolekwe, Minister for Fisheries and Aquaculture. <laughs> Honorable Osei Chain Men Sabunsu, Minister for <laughs> Parliamentary Affairs and Majority Leader. Honorable ministers will now be called upon to sign the oath book. Honorable Professor George Jan Bafo.
Honorable Catherine Abilima Afiku. So you're watching the live coverage of uh, the swearing-in ceremony of the 11 uh, additional ministerial nominees, including the Tourism, Arts and Culture Minister, Catherine Afeku, who you see on your screen just leaving. Uh, earlier, they were each given their instrument of office by the president. He handed it over to them right now. What they're doing is they're individually coming to sign uh, a book. They are pending their signatures as uh, ministers officially ready to embark on their official duties. Now, as you know, um, Parliament, as you know, Parliament earlier today approved the nominations of all of these uh, uh, ministerial nominees. Uh, there was the expectation that the minority would uh, kick against the nomination of a tourism minister designate, or rather tourism minister now, as she's been approved, Catherine Afeku, uh, because she had also indicated, as in the case of gender minister Otiko Afiso, Afisa Jaba, that um, uh, she had not undertaken uh, the mandatory national service. But um, minority members have agreed to allow her to pass. They have not given any indication as to why they did not kick against her nomination, seeing as she had that same uh, issue that they had with uh, Otiku, Otiku Afiso uh, Jaba there. So the minority approved her nomination, as well as that of Sports Minister Isaac Isiyama and uh, uh, nine others. And they are right now appending their signatures. So you're still watching Joy News. Prime, and uh, right now you see the information minister, Mustafa Hamid, there also appending his signature. You're watching Joy News uh, Prime. We're breaking and we're taking a short break. We'll be back with Joy News Interactive. Don't go away. <laughs> 